It's time for Twink This Week and Google with Jeff and Gina. And we're going to put another Googler on the spot. Chris Bona is here, the uh, open source program manager for Google. We'll ask him, Android, is it really open source? That's next on Twig. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twig. Bandwidth for This Week in Google is provided by CashFly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twig. This Week in Google. Episode 89, recorded April 6th, 2011. The Hidden Menu. This Week in Google is brought to you by Carbonite. Backing up the files on your PC or Mac is safe and easy with Carbonite. For a free trial, plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com. Offer code TWIG. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free 14-day trial, go to Squarespace.com slash TWIG. And by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look more professional. Get started with a free package at FreshBooks.com. It's time for Twig! Let me sit up straight. This Week in Google, the show that talks about... And somebody emailed me and said, boy, with what's going on uh, right now with Amazon, you really should say This Week in Amazon and Google, or we'll just say This Week in Google and the cloud. How about that? Our guests, as always today, Gina Trapani from SmarterWare.org. Hi, Gina. Hello. Great to be here. Great to see you, as always. Jeff Jarvis, who's at a conference uh, right now. Uh, for uh, continuing care um, assisted living facilities, I mean communities. Are they interested in the Google? Yeah, they are actually. They're, you know, it's, it's a business like every other, and, and they have oh, all kinds of. Oh, you're not speaking to the old folks. You're talking to the <laughs> no, no, to the people who own the places. <laughs> oh, okay. That <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Jeff is the author of this great book. What would Google? What would Google do? And his new book, Public Parts, went to the printers. Right. Went to the copy editor. Yep. Oh, man, there's another layer. There's another oh, layer. Oh, Congratulations. Another I know it's a series of steps. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Bit by bit, inch by inch. Death by a thousand cuts. Paper cuts, yes. Paper cuts. And good news. We've got Chris Tabona with us. Yay. He's been very kind to allow Woo. us to defer and defer and defer and... We're glad to get you on. I'm, I'm just not that important. So you are even super after important. having had uh, skull <laughs> surgery and has the uh, the thing still attached to him. Yes. 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 I'm wearing. So I, I couldn't find my regular sort of like discreet, really you know, lovely like Jeff Jarvis esque headset, and so I decided to go with really big. He's wearing his so. gamer headsets. But it, it was actually they had it in the tech stop here, so I was like, yeah, I just need one with like a mic and a USB interface. So like here. <laughs> I'm and telling like you, they're gamer thing. headsets. Just resist the urge to say, I teabag you, okay? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. Yeah, I'm not political. You're not so. that kind. Yeah, you're not political. <laughs> Chris, uh, first of all, is an old friend, of course. He, uh, he came on uh, regularly on the screensavers to talk about open source software. Uh, he was at SourceForge where he was uh, involved in uh, uh, that. Uh, you know, Actually, it wasn't SourceForge. It was... Uh, you were responsible well, for SourceForge, but it was VA Linux. Well, responsible is a strong word. I named it, and 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 I'll defend that to my death. But you know, the other guys wrote the code, and okay. I just made. Sure he just gave it the name. That's all. And he's it's now at Google. He's a pro pro uh, program manager for their open source projects. Quite a few yes. of them, as you might imagine, at Google. Yes. Uh, Code.google.com is a place to go to find out about that. In fact, it is the summer of code. Coming yeah, we soon. just uh, launched student applications. So we've already gotten a couple of thousand student applications in. And Would you tell us what that is? Uh, you know, uh, last year Google bought advertising on our open source show. which oh, we which, done that again. Which Chris hosted, by the way, in the early days, Floss Weekly. Randall Schwartz has ably yes. taken over. Is that over still going me. on? Oh, more. Yeah, we just did it this morning. It's been fast. <laughs> you know, the thing about Randall, uh, you were so busy, it was hard to get a weekly show out of you. But Ra and I kept erasing the shows, which didn't help. That didn't help. No. Brian Aker will never forgive me for that. But uh, <laughs> three interviews we did. Three <laughs> times we had to talk three, to him. Three. I, yeah, after no. I raced it accidentally the second time, I sent him a basket of coffee goods. That was nice. Of you to do. <laughs> and just really felt terrible. But we finally did get that Brian Aker interview on the air. Randall Schwartz <laughs> took over a couple of years ago. He's done a great he's job. Reliable. Well, he's kept it alive. He really, uh, and I really appreciate it. But both of you, uh, of course, are great, uh, great friends of open source. Um, 
And I brought that up for some... Oh, yes, because Google uh, sponsored Floss Weekly last summer. Didn't do it this year. But nevertheless, Chris, here's mm. your chance to put in a big plug because I think this is a great, uh, a great uh, pro yeah, program so that Google does. so if people are in university... Uh, or attached to a university in, in some strange way, um, you can try out for the Summer of Code. You basically apply to take part uh, in the program. And what it is is uh, various open source organizations work with us to uh, mentor students through the summer. And we pay you if you're successful. If you meet the goals of the program, you get paid $5,000 through the course of the summer. And, yeah, so it's pretty good. You bring in uh, – it actually starts with – Companies who have open source projects who... Well, it, some companies, but mostly just pure sort of open source projects and organizations like Python, Apache, and all the names you'd expect to see. So, so they apply. Yeah. And then uh, you pick the 107, 107 projects? 170 different projects. Wow. Uh, we had about we had about 600 apply this year. Wow. And it's always heartbreaking because they're all so great. Uh, well, most of them are. And, and like, <laughs> you know, so, and we have to pick really a smaller number than we wish we could because, you know, we're, we're spending about $7 million on the program this year. Wow. wow. And so, you know, we want to make sure that the organizations that are taking part get a good flow of students. And so that restricts the numbers we can take on because we, we, we we're accepting 1,200 students this year. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it's really something. So. If you go to Google, uh, code.google.com slash SOC, you can uh, find out yeah. more. This is, exactly. and let me encourage students, uh, computer science students, to, uh, to, to, to follow up on this. This is a great way to get an experience of working uh, for an open source project, to get paid while you're doing it, which is great. And mm -hmm. often, many of these students go on to very successful careers uh, yeah. As coders, sometimes for open source, sometimes not. I mean, it's a re it's a really great thing for your resume. Gina, it's how's your coder ridiculous. So I, I hear people from uh, other companies, uh, even even folks like uh, you know the Facebooks and the Microsoft of the world. They said, if I see a summer of code successful yep. summer of code student, yep. Yep. I can almost guarantee that they'll get hired. Okay, so, wow, that says That's it right great. there. Jeff, what did you say? I was asking Gina how her summer of code person worked last summer, if she knows where uh, yeah, I think it was a he is. Yeah, because, you know, we fail people if they're bad, you know. Right. So. So yeah, you know. yeah. We had a great experience. So I was a mentor in last summer, Summer of Code, and uh, myself and my other lead developer were mentors, and we had two great students, and it was a really, really successful. Um, my, my student built the installer for ThinkUp, so you know you don't have to edit any config files. It's kind of a, a wizard that steps you through a three-step installer. And our other student built um, a Google map of geo visualization of tweets and replies and retweets, and it was it was amazing. It was such a good experience um, that we're you know that we continue to do mentoring programs kind of in-house at ThinkUp. Oh, because it was just cool. such a great, such a great way to kind of develop. I mean, these our students were just they were so smart and they were so eager and they wanted to do such a good job. And and in fact, um, our uh, one of the two students that we mentored during last summer is still very active in the project and still contributing, which is awesome. So it's a great mm -hmm. program for for students and mentors. I highly highly recommend it. Why does Google do this, Chris? Uh, you know, we started because Larry felt that there were a lot of computer science students that weren't doing computer science over the summer, and he wanted to figure out a way of, you know, productively pay them to work on, on coding and to retain their edge instead of having that summer drop off in knowledge uh, and sort of like the momentum of their computer science career. That's cool. Uh, and, and studies. So it's, so it's purely pro bono? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, if you look pro at the rules... Pro de bono. Sorry. And uh, <laughs> uh, if you look at the rules, we don't even require that the organizations accept the code, uh, even if they pass the student. Um, so, because we didn't want there to be the situation where the student oh, yeah. wrote good things, but it really wasn't quite right wasn't for the organization. Usable, right. Yeah. You know. So, but about probably about a third of the students go on to keep working on their projects and, and making sure they're integrated with their with their mentors project and and and, re, and remain members of that community which is pretty exciting especially when you consider these guys they're going back to school these gals are going back to school so you know it's pretty it's pretty nice and then you know we do feel uh, that you know open source has done an awful lot for Google and for the internet and it seems this is a pretty good way of giving back it creates more open source developers it creates more open source code and those are things that are actually really really hard to make happen so it's sort of like a really nice sweet spot and there's a lot of love for the program internally you know if you talk to like Alan Eustace who's one of our senior VPs of engineering and 
you know, he just, he loved the program. So even if I go away, I know the Summer of Code would just That's be great. great here. Well, thank you for doing that, Chris. Really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, I've got a great team that does all the work, Carol and Cadno. We are going to, we're going to put Chris on the spot in a little bit because, uh, okay. There's a little talk about Android, whether it's open or sure. not. This was Larry sure. Page's first week as CEO. And yes, Monday was the big day. Everything's different. <laughs> and the, yeah. Everything's changed. <laughs> everything's <laughs> blue <laughs> now. This room up here. And, uh, and uh, there was a big exit. From Eric to Larry, you know, in our, in our shrines. <laughs> well, no. We're going to talk about that in just a bit. And also, I'm going to uh, challenge myself. You see these? These are, ah. these are two tablets. This is uh, the iPad 2. The, I what? I've, the I've iPad never... 2. Running iOS. This Did you is... call Steve and see if it was okay to turn it on before doing anything? Yeah, I had to get permission. She likes to have control. This and... is a Zoom. <laughs> now, I know how to turn on the iPad, too. In fact, if I lift, lift the magical revolutionary cover, it just turns itself on. But I, huh. I'm, I'm a little puzzled. Uh, there's no on-off switch. So I, in, a, in a moment, when we return, I will attempt to turn on the Zoom. <laughs> yes, it's an exciting new feature. <laughs> How do you turn on the Zoom? Coming up with This Week in Google. First, though, I'd like to mention uh, one of our great sponsors, the great folks at Carbonite.com, Backup Kings Extraordinaire. My kid was in here a few minutes ago, and he's a great example of how the cobbler's kids have no shoes. So he, uh, he's been making a lot of music. He uses uh, Logic Express, and he's really into it, like he, morning, noon, and night. Uh, and I was very supportive of it, but... His hard drive died on his iMac. He came downstairs and said, Dad, I can't, the computer won't boot. And I said, oh. And I said, you've been backing up, right? He said, what? And I thought, that's really not his fault. It's my, it's my fault. It uh, and he, lo he lost everything he'd worked on for about six months. Now, fortunately, Ooh. I was able to recover that drive thanks to some wizardry that I've learned in the past. But, man, next time, from now on, Carbonite.com. Because it's automatic cloud backup. So, it, you know... Even if you're backing up locally, which he's also doing, I, I brought up an external hard drive and it's automatically using Chronosync to back up to that. I have a network attached storage is backing up to that, and I have Carbonite. It's never he's never going to lose any data again. While you're online, Carbonite trickles your data back up to the internet, where it's always safe. The nice thing about this, 55 bucks a year is unlimited storage, all the all the personal stuff in your internal drive. So I don't have to worry about how much music he's making. I don't get tiered up. The price doesn't suddenly go up. I buy a year subscription. I know that's good for the next 12 months. And I have to say, it's really cloud storage, you know. I mean, uh, if, if 55 bucks sounds like a lot, look at how much it costs to, to just to do 50 gigs on Dropbox. This is half that. Half, less than half that. Uh, and it's just like Dropbox in the sense that I can log on to my Carbonite account on any computer, on my iPhone, my Android phone, my BlackBerry, and there's my data. I can access it and use it even before disaster strikes. Carbonite is so great. You get your data back with a couple of clicks of the mouse. It's PC or Mac, cloud storage, encryption, of course, 128-bit SSL to the cloud, but you can also add, uh, I think it has uh, Blowfish and Triple Desk uh, encryption available so you can have completely secure private data. Look, try it for two weeks, free, Carbonite.com, offer code TWIG. Please do use that offer code so we get credit for that, T-W-I-G. And that's two weeks free, no credit card or anything, just the word TWIG. And if you decide to buy, continue to use that offer code. So when, you, when you buy, you check out for the year subscription because that 12 months turns into 14 months automatically. Two months free with your subscription if you use the offer code TWIG. Carbonite, you got to back it up to get it back, so do it right. Hey, Carbonite. Okay, now don't laugh at me. I'm sure there's an easy way. Okay, there's no <laughs> buttons on the front. I was a good five minutes, Leo. So you oh, and please. Gina both have, well, all three of you have one. I'm sure Chris No, has I don't one. have one. I was in the store. Okay, nothing there. Nothing on the bottom. <laughs> I did the same exact thing. Uh, oh, don't, Gina, don't tell them the secret word. Is this it? It's, is this, this must be it. Yay. Oh, so there's a button you're... on the back. That wasn't that hard. Once you know it. And it even has like a little icon. On 13 there. seconds. That wasn't bad. It has an icon with on, off, and lock. So, okay. So, now what? Slide. There oh, you go. that's cool. App Store. Mac, oh, you installed the new uh, Amazon App Store. Yeah, that's nice. So, is there Now, there was an interesting story that said uh, that Steve Jobs actually vastly overestimated the number of native honeycomb applications. He said, he said hundreds. There's about 17 or something like that. Um, Top right, apps. Okay. There we go. So let's say Beluga. Now, that's, that's written for Android phones. 
But that scales perfectly nicely. I mean, it's got a lot of stuff on the right there, but that's okay. If I go in there, the message is, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's all they mean is it doesn't, it's like not taking advantage of the real estate. So what do you think, Gina? You've had it for a couple of weeks now. Are you happy with it? I like it. I like it a lot. The only uh, app that I've found that doesn't run full screen is Mint, which I guess, uh, you know, when they built the app, they just said it should be this size. But right. everything else kind of fills fills the screen. Um, I like it very much. I like the Gmail client a lot. I mean, the Gmail client is kind of like is, uh -huh. is what a real honeycomb app looks like, you know, with taking advantage of, 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 of all those. That's one estate. of the 17. Right. And, you know, it's honestly, the Gmail, the Gmail app is the reason why I'm on Android to begin with is I live my life in Gmail and it's just the best client anywhere. Um, um, actually, I, this I like is pretty nice. Much. This is very, uh, very usable. Yeah. Yeah. So it slid over like that. I like that. That's great. Angry Birds is obviously awesome. Uh, love the Kindle <laughs> app uh, and InstaFetch. I'd like to re read my kind of, you know, read it later. Uh, things from Instapaper. So I like it very much. It crashes once in a while. It still feels a little half-baked here and there. Uh, but And it's heavy, like you said, Leo. It is. It feels, when you compare it, it to the iPad, too, it is, feels heavy. But you're saying, uh, Chris, that it is, it's how many, how many apps are there now, Chris? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's well over 17. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 25, 100. It doesn't matter. Uh, oh, the truth is, think. if most apps look fine, I don't think that makes a big yeah, difference. Yeah, most of them scale, just like no yeah. problem. I mean, the, the issue, though, is how well uh, this and the Atrix are doing, the two Motorola products. This one is the, is the first Honeycomb tablet. The Atrix is that dual well, core Atrix phone. has that thing where you can dock it in a laptop. I've yeah, for tried 500 that. bucks. I've tried it. It's kind of nutty because uh, it's so is it expensive. Nutty, is it neat, though? I mean, you know. Well, here's the deal. You're going to get a, you get a little docking station that's about the same size and weight as a netbook. Mm -hmm. uh, for five hundred dollars, yeah, over and above the phone, and it's running yeah. kind of Linux. It's not a you know, it's not a kind of familiar operating system. I don't think it's selling that well. In fact, that's that's How the do you story. Think the, uh, the Asus one will do. You know, the one with the built-in. You can slide it off the keyboard dock thing. You know, I haven't seen that. Have one. you seen that one? No. Yeah, it's coming out in America ish. Android. -ish. Yeah, no, it's, it's running uh, Honeycomb, and then it, it you can just use it as a ten-inch tablet, and then you can. Also, dock it in this keyboard battery-based thing that makes it into look like a netbook, but it still runs Honeycomb. So, oh, that's yeah, interesting. Then like, so then it turns it into you like an extra eight hours of battery and everything. It's really, yeah. pretty pretty. You know, so. What about Andy Rubin saying Honeycomb? We kind of rushed it. It wasn't ready. It's uh, and then uh, and then actually let's 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 put you on the spot. Open source program okay. manager. Okay. What about the people who say, "Ha ha! See, we told you, uh, Android's not open source." So, so what I want you to do is whenever you read an article like that, see if they con they conclude with, and therefore I'm going to use an iPhone. Yes, almost always. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, that's not ever open source right. at all. Not even right? close. So, you know, we've delayed the release of Honeycomb's uh, stuff. Uh, it's still compliant with the open source licenses for the GPL and LGPL components. That's all fine. Um, but the Apache stuff, which is what most people think of as, as Android, uh, we're just delaying it until until later. It, when we brought out Honeycomb, it wasn't that we rushed it out so much as we, if we put that on a phone, it would be terrible. Um, and it right. would look right. And we haven't harmonized that for the phone, the UI. The so UI, how, how, so Android right, is so. open source in the sense that it is uh, the Open Handset Alliance. There is a... No. Source code base, Google adds stuff on top of it, but each new version, Google holds on to the source code for a while, right? Uh, only recently did we ever delay. So before Honeycomb, we actually commonly uh, always released by first customer ship, um, but commonly released up to a month ahead of time. So this was the first time we actually delayed. But the, why hold it at all? Why not have it in, uh, you know, on a... Uh, uh, code.google.com. Why not just keep the source up there? Well, I mean, Andy really feels that to reduce the chance of people installing this on phones and reducing fragmentation, that we should delay it this time. So Does that make it doing. not open source? It makes Honeycomb not open source. Okay. Yes. It doesn't make Android not open source, though. And I know that seems like splitting hairs, but basically up through Gingerbread, it's all there. All the code is there. You can't take it back. We wouldn't take it back. And we're committed to open sourcing uh, the code, so it's just a matter of time. So, uh, what is the license? Oh, uh, so it's Linux on the bottom. So Linux is GPL, and then we have various system utilities. Some of which are GPL, but most of them are BSD. And then you have the Android frameworks and UI and the rest, and those are Apache. 
And then there are some proprietary software, like the Gmail client is proprietary, the Maps uh, client is proprietary, and that's just proprietary software. So, so I mean, I don't see how you can say something that's licensed BSD or GPL or Apache is not open source. Well, you know, people are, you know, they're a little upset uh, because they want Honeycomb out now, in total, right? Uh, they don't just want the, the kernel and the rest. They want everything. And I, I understand that desire. But, you know, they'll be satisfied when we do it. Um, unfortunately, they won't be satisfied until we do it. And so <laughs> some people, you know, people don't go from love to, you know, respect. They go from love to hate. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> There's no the middle world. ground. <laughs> And and so all I'll say is that, you know, we know, and it'll come out. But sorry, it's not out yet. Right. Yeah. Gina, you got anything? Or I, 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 you know, I think that, listen, I think that's reasonable. To me, Android is open enough. I mean, the, I mean, the thing that people are upset about, it's like, it's like open source. It's not open unless the source is released, right? Honeycomb source isn't released. That's why Chris just said Honeycomb is an open source, but Android is. Uh, Le, you know, Leo's question is, you know, do you define open source it as I get to see the day's commits that night versus kind of dropping it, you know, kind of later on? To some people, you know, to the, the purists, it, that's, you know, doesn't necessarily jibe. And, you know, the thing I keep hearing is Google is using this, the open word as a marketing gimmick versus, you know, they're not walking the, the talk. I don't necessarily think that. Um, but, you know, when you're kind of going to base Android's whole cell to developers and, and to users to, to some extent and handset makers as, as that it's open, not releasing the source, you know, it feels, it feels uncomfortable. I, I wish that we had a date, you know, we had an idea. Like, like, Chris, can you say that Honeycomb will drop sometime this year or this quarter? I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't want to put you on the spot. But I feel like no, that no, would It's okay to put me on the spot. I can't actually answer the question, though. I yeah. can't answer it for Andy. I can't answer it for the Android. So it wouldn't be right for me to do so. Right. So, Right. You know. Is there a chance that Honeycomb will never drop, but the, it'll incorporate the Honeycomb changes into the next version that will be phone ready and tablet ready? No, I mean those those that code's moving forward. It's not like we're gonna yes. pretend that did, that Honeycomb didn't exist. I, I don't. That's likely at all. So, okay. yeah. I think the and, best. And what I would say. So the funny thing about Google is, you know, so we we've done a lot of open source projects. We've done Chromium. We've done, you know, Android. We've done. We released 400 different projects last year, and so if you look at Google, we have every kind of project that will either make you happy as an open source advocate or make you unhappy. <laughs> you know, we have ones that are just you know, pure API releases. Uh, that won't work if Google goes away, and we release them once. We have Chromium, which is this huge project, and they do all their development pretty much in the open, almost universally. And it's like, you know, so, you know, you know we have our prod kernels, which do a ton of patches out to the mainline kernel. We have the Android kernel, which is sort of, sort of does some funny things with wake locks, and so we're only now finally getting more mainlining. So you basically, you can pick and choose. If you want to be upset at Google, you can find something that will make you upset. If you want to be really happy about Google, I can point out a million things that will make you happy. So, so it comes down to, you know, how can we do what's best for the product and what's best for the open source community, and do those converge? A lot of times they do. Sometimes it gets kind of weird. And that's just the nature of being in a very large organization. Well, it's, it's also the nature of, the, and it's a slippery slope of being, of providing a handset operating system. Yeah, and remember, you know, we, we have people who are making phone calls with this stuff. So, right. you know, and, and it's not just the a demands. computer. It's not, a, it's not Chrome OS. It's, uh, it's something very different. Network operators and handset manufacturers both weigh in with their requirements here. I'm not defending so it. I'm not defending it, but I just. Yeah, no, you, you don't need to. I mean, mobile, though, is substantively different than shipping a computer. Uh, you know, there are regulatory requirements that are incredibly difficult to, to navigate. There are all kinds of things. And, and we set out to change the world of mobile with Android. And part of that strategy was open sourcing. And if you look at what Android has done and how many people have taken it and run with it. I mean, can you picture an Amazon App Store on iPhone? I mean, no way, right? And it's like it's in the nature of Android to, to help that kind of thing happen. So... So, yeah, I think that it's important. It's still very important. And so you feel confident. I know I'm not asking you for a commitment, although I'd like to, but I, I don't think it's yours to make. <laughs> but you feel yeah. confident that the source will be released at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, obviously, only Andy Rubin can make that commitment. He might not even be able to make that commitment. <laughs> you know, it, the way that Andy works and the way that Android works is that instead of making commitments, instead of going on programs and talking, they're not, yeah, I'm more outgoing, I guess, but um, they'll just do it. 
And, and that's, that level of communication is probably what frustrates some people, you know, but in some ways the Android team is just more introverted, you know, <laughs> uh, when it oh, comes to the rest of the world of open source. And I think that comes out of coming out of the mobile world. You know, mobile companies are used to talking in a certain way. They with each don't other. want they, openness you know, at all. I mean, it's amazing well, you could even get close to open on a handset, to be honest. They're sensitive. And, and some of those sensitivities might be overwrought. Um, but they are sensitive. And so, you know, we want them to like Android. We want them to use Android. And so that means we have to work with them, and we want to work with them. So, you know, if you look at what Android's been able to pull off over the last three years, it's pretty amazing, you know? I mean, the number of, of carriers and handset manufacturers that have adopted Android, it's pretty great. So given the nature of the business, right? So I get, I'm, I'm yeah. looking at, I think the most um, cogent of the arguments came from Ryan Paul and Ars Technica. And uh, what he says, and I, and I think this is legitimate, is that it creates uncertainty. Uh, the lack, he says, unfortunately, the utter lack of transparency surrounding Android development and the absence of a public roadmap make it impossible to guess if or when uh, Honeycomb will, you know, be released. Uh, the lack of code availability is especially bad for enthusiasts who are hoping to be able to install custom firmware on their Android tablets. Mm -hmm. But ultimately... Um, he says, even after the matter is resolved, the fact is that Google is willing to withhold source code at its whim for competitive reasons, might argue about why, what the reasons are, but is going to cast a dark shadow over the company's increasingly hollow claim that Android is an open platform. That's an angry, <laughs> angry thing. Yeah, that, that was, that was a quite a rant. That's an <laughs> angry <laughs> man. <laughs> but but, but, I, no, but I, I think I mean, that he, the, one, well, the one thing that I do say is absolutely true is it creates an uncertainty, a cloud of uncertainty. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, I mean, think about it. When we announced Android, I think it was in like 2007 or something crazy like that, there was no code for a year. You know, when we brought out the first rev of Android, there wasn't even a phone that was running it for another, I think, three weeks. And, you know, there's always going to be uncertainty. You know, the world of software is not certain. Um, the, problem what with, is certain. the problem with purists yeah. is that life is not pure. I mean, you know, I'm going to come off like Google well, Family you know, again. I would say to the purist, if they, if they want purity, I have gingerbread. Gingerbread is purity. Gingerbread is enthusiasm. Fully open sourced. It's all out it's there except for the, the top source. layer that's Google juice only, Gmail and stuff like that. All the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, and, and those people don't care about that. And for those applications, we offer, you know, standardized IMAP interfaces so they can use the open source email program. They can they can do whatever they want. There. I'd love so, to know about a roadmap, though. I think that's an interesting point, too. There's not sure. really been an... And I think that yeah. a roadmap that will satisfy enthusiasts would be very, very difficult to come up with. I think they have roadmaps that they share with handset manufacturers and carrier partners who are committed to shipping hundreds of thousands of units a day. And so they prioritize. Yeah, I agree. Know, this is the difficult the part of being... ship the hardware because yeah. they're the ones making the multi-billion dollar commitments to the platform. Yeah, that's the problem and of that's being that's really hard for people to hear because open source doesn't work with that way. It doesn't right. work on commitments of shipping tens of thousands of units a day or hundreds of thousands of units a day. They work on the idea that developers can have control over their individual piece of hardware. But when we have to pay attention to the 350,000 plus devices that are shipping every day, it means that you end up walking a little bit away from the people who can't ship that many. And that kind of stinks, right? Because it makes you feel like, oh, am I not cool enough? Am I not popular enough? Well, you are. But right now, we have to concentrate on the future of the platform. And that means the people who will make that future, which, frankly, kind of isn't the enthusiast community. That said, you know, if you look at, like, the application developers, we try to cater to them like crazy. And they are being well served by the SDKs and all the rest. So it's like, it's really tough because, you know, I mean, these are my friends. I hate seeing them unhappy, you know. And these are people who I, I, I'm, I'm also paid to care about, but I also care about them. So I want to satisfy them. But, you know, right now, Android, satisfaction with Android means let me introduce you to gingerbread. And, and honeycomb will come later. So. Well, and uh, the, the op opposite of this would be open moku. Which was a fully open cell phone platform that didn't go anywhere because you couldn't get a handset manufacturer to use it. Well, you know, OpenMoco tried, right? And then they did some really remarkable things for, for what they had. So, you know, good but on the, them. Same but, thing you know, with Migo and like Symbian. I mean, they've all tried open source. Open source is really hard. It's hard to do in that cell space. Phones are really hard. Yeah. I mean, and Android's kicking ass. Right. right. Android's kicking butt, right? Um, yep. So the question becomes so open source is really hard. 
Sailor is really hard. Mobile is really hard. UIs are really hard. All this stuff is really hard. And, and the punishment for failure is you lose a lot of money. You lose a lot of time. You lose 400 engineers working, you know, you know, night and day weekends for four years. Right. You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough commitment to make. And then many people simply fail when they try it. I mean, think of, the, think of all the, the mobile OSs that simply aren't around anymore. I mean, can you picture the Sony Ericsson mobile in your mind anymore? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I really don't and, want to picture and, the and Android like robot Sony. with his own on thumbs, but that's and another thing. <laughs> really like Android, and that's great, but it's like, you know, they also see it as a way of, wow, we don't have to develop our own operating system anymore. Right. That's really good for us, right. you know? Yeah, so. yeah, and that was, I'm sure, why Nokia took a billion-dollar payout from Microsoft and said, okay, forget Symbian. We didn't really like that anyway. And I'm not going near that. <laughs> <laughs> so Larry's first week as CEO, yeah. what, where is Eric? Is he, uh, he's writing a book, I heard. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he was working with a co-writer by the name of Jared Cohen on a book. But I, I'm not. I have no idea what the status is. You know, Eric and I, we don't hang out. I don't know if you know this. Oh, um, I, I know of editors who <laughs> who've seen the book proposal. I don't is know. Is it much a tell-all? <laughs> yes, it, it'll say all the nasty things. <laughs> no, I don't. Know. I, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. So Eric is going to write, I'm sure, a very interesting book, and I, I'm going to read it. I have no Ooh, idea. What well, it's we about. will too, of course. No matter what. I, I understand it's a uh, it's a historical romance based in the 1800s. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Larry Page takes uh, power, and uh, Jonathan yes. Rosenberg uh, exits, senior vice president That's of product good. management. Yes, hard not to draw uh, a connection. I'm going to let someone else draw that connection because I honestly have no idea. What do you think, uh, Jeff? You know, is was Jonathan uh, uh, Eric's man? I, I what I've heard and seen, but it's not much more than anyone else has, is just that it's uh, number one. One word was that uh, uh, Larry wanted a long-term commitment from people, and um, which I understand that he's built. He's building his team now. Oh, that's interesting. And he's going to depend upon his team. Right. And then secondly, that uh, you know you're bound to have changes in how things operate. And I don't know that it was Larry versus Eric because the you know tell me if I'm wrong, Chris, but. It, it, I, I doubt you really could have much of the way of camps because you had to please all three all the time, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, you know, the times when I've had to go for them for approval for things, you know, I know it's all three of them in the room. It always seemed extremely collegial. They all seem to work really yeah. well and productively together. So it's it's hard to it's hard to criticize, you know. Yeah. So. He wrote the um, the meaning of open um, memo, right? Which was a great memo. Yes. yes. Yeah. Right at the in December, right? Right before yeah. the holidays. Yeah. Um, so have you seen, I mean, have they changed the paint scheme? Uh, anything going on around there that's a little different now with Larry? We installed uh, more electric car parking. You know, uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> we like that. You know, I mean, Earth what's funny is, you know, the announcement now. that yeah. Eric, uh, you know, transitioning to the, I guess, the chairman role. Right. Uh, or or what it, whatever. Uh, was, I guess, almost a month and a half ago now. Right. Um, and I guess, you know, I was just sort of like, oh, okay, it's changed. Um, yeah, you, know, you kind of expect when, at a company that size, business as usual, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, you know, Eric had been here almost a decade, right? right. So it's, it's a long time, right? So, yeah, you know, it, it was okay. And, and you know, I, I, I have nothing but respect for Larry. So, you know, I don't just say that because he's the boss. He's, he's <laughs> always kind of good. I may go a little valley wag on you, though, here. Okay. According, according, to, <laughs> according to Search Engine Land... For change in land, okay. <laughs> uh, Chris Sherman writing. Um, Eric Schmidt apparently tried to get the search results. This is uh, this is an excerpt from Stephen Levy's book in the Plex. Mm -hmm. Asked uh, Google to remove search results about a political donation that he had made, according to uh, uh, Stephen Levy writing. One day, Denise Griffin got a call from Eric Schmidt's assistant. "Quote: There's this information about Eric and the indexes," she told Griffin, "and we want it out." To her credit, by the way, or to the Google's credit, they did not. Which I think is important. <laughs> they did not. That was, that was the best part of that. So I guess the Times if, if published this, true, this excerpt. True. Yeah, this is from the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Of, uh, of, of Stephen's book. Stephen's going to be on the show at the end of the month. Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah. I love Stephen. He's great. Guy that wrote yeah, Hacker. Really he's he's, yeah. uh, he's performing, performing, doing a reading at the uh, Computer History Museum, I think, tonight. Oh, neat. Oh, very up. cool. Griffin explained that it wasn't Google's policy to take things like that out of the index just because people didn't want it there. After she hung up the phone, she freaked out. Doesn't Eric know we don't do that? 
<laughs> That's my favorite line. <laughs> Doesn't Eric know? We don't know when this happened. I mean, it might have been. Maybe it was his. Maybe it was his first day. I don't know. Well, it was so long ago that uh, a certain Facebook executive was the one who supposedly said no. Oh, that's Cheryl Sandberg. Cheryl Sandberg. That's Sandberg, right. Yeah. Who is awesome? Wow. <laughs> she did. A, she did a really good TED talk recently. I don't know a few, but she's at Facebook now. But she 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 did a great TED TED talk about sort of women in the workplace. But I love that she she supposedly was the one who said no. We're not we're not taking it out. Denise Griffin yeah. calls her boss Cheryl Sandberg, and they had several conversations before they finally trudged up to Eric's office and told him it wasn't Google's job, nor should it be, to filter his personal information. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> and by the way, you can still get those search results for um, for Schmidt's uh, political donations. Did not I guess he didn't take a job as uh, Secretary of Commerce? Is that off the table? Did the did Obama hire somebody? We don't know. Uh, I know that he he said the Secretary of Commerce was now the ambassador to China. Right. Which is an interesting, you know, sort of like you graduated to that, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I guess the spot's open if you want it. Leo. Do you think yeah. Rosenberg? Yeah, I do want it. Do you think Rosenberg yeah. will go to Facebook? <laughs> oh, gosh. I have no idea. You know, I got all they are, you know. Um, They're he, building that nice new campus in the old Sun, uh, the Sun uh, campus in uh, Menlo Park. Oh, so I have to be honest with you. When I heard about them moving to the, well, we used to call that Sun Quentin. Sun Quentin. Um, yeah, because it's basically at the end of Willow Road, right on the water. And to get to it, it during traffic in the morning, it literally takes like 20 minutes to do the mile from 101 oh, to that location. I'm sure they're building a like, tunnel just for uh, Facebook Unless they employees. build like their own subway and their own monorail or something. <laughs> I just, I'm like, wow, you just destroyed an hour's worth of productivity for every employee who works on that site. Well, no, the <laughs> problem is, and, the, and the, probably the much of the point of this is, don't leave. <laughs> Do not leave. They give them three free meals a day. Uh, they're, they're having special cafes built by a very famous restaurant designer. Yeah. No, I'm sure they'll be lovely, but I mean, <laughs> getting to work is going to be a huge hassle. I'll never leave. I'm you know, my, my, you. my sister actually used to work uh, basically uh, in one of the, the sublet buildings there, and she's like, it's miserable. Uh, it, it, it took her less time to get to Foster City every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, family. man. Then it get there. So, um, and, yeah, I mean, I, and I'm not trying to tease Facebook. I mean, I have a lot of friends there. I just, man, you know, find somewhere else. They've yeah. got Roman and Williams. They uh, they did uh, Breslin and the John Dory restaurants uh, at the Ace Hotel in New York City. It's going to be very trendoid. Very <laughs> well, John beautiful. Dor that person did some, something else, too, that I really liked. Uh, anyways, it's not important. Yeah, Roman and Williams. Well, we can go to their website and find out more. Yes, uh, let's do that instead of doing the podcast. <laughs> I like it. The New, York Times also knew that, uh, the New York Times also knew that it was called Sun Quentin. That's good reporting. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. No, that is. I mean, that's kind of cultural out here. You know? <laughs> Son, Quentin. Google is building, bidding $900 million for Nortel's patent portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yep. They are. And they say they will use it as a defensive shield. Yes, so is that how this works now? They don't actually need any of the patents. They just need to be able to have something to throw at others who would throw things at them? Well, I mean, since we have articulated defensive patent policy at Google, it, it, it is worth saying, though, the Nortel patents, you know, they, they cover a lot of areas around networking, which we are very heavily invested in. So it kind of, mm -hmm. it kind of applies, right? So, so, yeah. They say both Android and Chrome will benefit uh, from this uh, acquisition. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, we've talked about this before, uh, Jeff, right? It's like mutually yeah. assured patent destruction. Right, it's just the damnedest business we've gotten ourselves into is all I'm saying, yeah. yeah. If, if you sue me over my patents, then I'll sue you over your, uh, you know. Well, the worst thing about it is it's so, it's so deleterious on it on people's yeah. time. You end up spending time in depositions. You end up spending time in court. You end up spending a lot of money on lawyers. It's, it's just, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tax, really on, on right. successful right. successful organizations. And I don't think it really helps the, quote, inventor, unquote, anymore. You know? It's like Larry Lessig says about fair use, that's a, that's a, a right only to hire lawyers. And yeah. in this case, too, this is, this is the, you know, the legal full employment act, and it's not doing yeah. what it's supposed to do, which is to improve innovation. Right. 
Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, the, the, I have a lot of opinions, most of which I can't share. So. <laughs> <laughs> we can read your mind, yeah. Chris. It's okay. You yeah. don't have to say. So, uh, Madonna, when you said you couldn't share an opinion in the uh, May 6th uh, episode of... <laughs> what was Michigan that opinion? Week, what was that opinion? Share it with us now. Uh, I'm going to show you why I'm moving to Italy, and it's not for the pasta. Isn't this the most amazing story? <laughs> when I type Leo Laporte is into... <laughs> oh, in, is into a, Google. A legendary broadcaster. Leo Laporte is an idiot. Is a douche. Is, a, is a Mac body. fanboy. Libel. The robots committed libel. I get well, to sue. That's what Italy says. And if I'm in Italy, I could win. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Chris Devona is here, program manager for Open Source at Google. Great to have you, Chris. Gina and Jeff also. We're talking about the Google and the cloud. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the cloud Amazon style in uh, just a little bit. And of course, why I'm moving to Italy. And it's actually might be for the pasta, actually. Pasta. Pasta. Yeah, yeah. You might find something, Leo. Come on. Yeah, that's the way. Pasta's always involved when you talk about it. Trapani's a town, right? Uh, yes, it is in Sicily. Yeah, we're going, baby. That's, let's do it, baby. Yeah. Trapani, here I come. <laughs> Meanwhile, yes. in order to go to Trapani and live there for the rest of my life, I have to invoice some clients. And fortunately, I have a cheap and easy way to do it. In fact, if you have fewer than three clients, three clients, it's free. Three or less is free at FreshBooks.com. This is actually I discovered this about uh, seven years ago now, when I was still sending out invoices. I started using FreshBooks. Amber MacArthur told me about it, and I tell you, it made me money because I was I was I hate invoicing so much. If you're a freelancer, you know what I'm talking about. That I would I would forget, I would put it off. I sent a company invoices nine months old once, and they said no. No, we don't have to pay you after. There's a statute of limitations. I got the money, but it wasn't easy. This changed my life. Freshbooks.com. You send them your logo. They uh, create and you know create on the website. You create these uh, invoices that look great, look professional. But they they have a special feature that I really love: a pay it now button, so that your your clients can just pay you. In fact, they can even set up automatic payment through their credit card. They also use 11 uh, payment services, including Authorize.net, PayPal, First Data. Makes it very easy to get paid. That means you're going to get paid more quickly. In fact, according to FreshBooks users, they get paid on average 14 days faster than before they started using FreshBooks. Got old-fashioned clients who still want paper invoices? FreshBooks will stamp them, print them, stamp them, and mail them for you for an additional fee. Not much. I, I can't remember what it was, but it's very affordable. Just a little bit over the postage. Uh, I just love FreshBooks. They even have an iPhone app that will automatically track hours and input it into the invoice, or you can do it on the web. You can you can actually invoice from your iPhone. Boy, I wish they'd had that in 2004. I want you to give it a try for free. FreshBooks.com. Sign up today, and you'll be in the drawing for a birthday cake. They're giving a free, it doesn't have to be your birthday. A free birthday cake every day this month. FreshBooks.com. Calm. Try it for free right now. Click that green button in the upper right-hand corner. We love them, and I know you're going to love them, too. Freshbooks.com, the easy way to invoice. So what's the story? Somebody sued because they didn't like the instant search results on Google? Right. The, the suggest. The Google suggest and the drop-down. That's, like, so that's what I'm getting right here where I go, Leo Laporte is an idiot, a douche, a Mac fanboy. That one? I think right, Mac fanboy those. is the one you should sue about. I want to sue him over that. So but don't you like the Mac? <laughs> <laughs> so this guy puts his name in, and the suggestion um, auto completes con and fraud, fraud Ooh. or con man afterwards, oh. and then he sues Google for libel, and he wins. And wins. This is in Italy. Wins. Yes, and he wins. Which is really scary because it then makes Google responsible for the content of the entire internet. That's exactly. What it really means. It's just. Oh, it, I, the, you really want to eat that pasta, knowing who makes it? Not anymore. <laughs> this is what the court. Uh, let's see. What did the? I'm trying to find the court. What the court said. I, I don't understand how this could even happen, except that the judge in the court was a nitwit. Well, yeah, the judge is a nitwit, and, and don't forget that there's there's a Google antipathy in Europe and also already in Italy, where three executives in Italy have been, you know, uh, found guilty of. I forget exactly what the crimes were, but um, David and right. two others, I think. Right, Chris. Right. 
Italian they legal were, system. There has was a video on YouTube things. that they felt we didn't pull That's down fast it. enough. Thank you. That Thank betrayed you. some Italian boys beating up on another Italian boy who's a special needs kid. You know, so yeah. I'm trying to trying to think somehow how could this could be justified. I guess the only thing you might the judge might have thought is, well, clearly this is gaming Google. Somebody's, I mean. Uh, and that Google should be more uh, insensitive to gaming, or could, should have. Who knows it's gaming? I mean, maybe it's it, like somebody it, named it, same name, right? I mean, it could be a couple things. It could be lots right. of things. It could be lots of things, but the, but the, but the precedent it sets is that it, it's the same worldview as my dear friends in Germany that they expect the internet to be controlled and packaged like a medium, and that this whole they just don't understand what it is. Um, and they don't understand the, the, the freedom of speech issues. That that's like saying that, that you could sue every library in Italy if it has a book you don't like in it. Or it's like the libel tourism that we see in the UK, that if you say something, if I say something bad about some scuzz bucket uh, and one person in the UK reads it, then he can sue me in the UK because the laws are better there. But why do the I get Leo Laporte as a douchebag when Gina gets Gina Trapani is married? <laughs> it's just not right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> Uh, but the problem here is that what we get down to is a lowest common denominator or, or highest watermark, I guess, of idiocy that we become liable to. So the EU, Vivian Redding, just put together a set of four principles for the Internet, one of which is that, and this makes sense on its face, but it doesn't in, in practice, is that if you have data in a, um, uh, a service in Europe and the data is stored in the U.S., that it's now, she would propose European law, that Ugh. it has to be stored under the same exact Terrible. rules as Europe. Well, if we grant that kind of reciprocity to the UK, the, U, the EU rather, I'm saying the EU, what happens when China says, ah, we claim the same rule. Right. Then we're all ruled by the highest watermark of censorship, the highest watermark of control, and the internet cannot work that way. By so the way, Jeff... A funny story, but it's a dangerous mindset. Jeff, Google has a response to you. <laughs> Jeff Jarvis is an idiot. Jeff idiot. Jarvis is a twit. twit. I mean, that's, a, is, that's a compliment. It seems like it's just a fundamental misunderstanding that, like, this is content that Google is saying yeah, that this person is. Focus. And I mean, the, the Google was doing some editing. I mean, at the press event when Google announced um, the 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 auto suggest, didn't Irina Stutsky? Didn't she say? I'm not sure how to say her last name, but like her name, there were no suggestions for her because she was blocked because of the slut. Right. Right. And Slutsky. Um, mm -hmm. Which she's not now. I see, but but Google is doing some of, of that kind of thing. I mean, they're I, doing I, generic I, I, word word cases, but just but for porno. I, I know they do safe search editing on suggestions. Yeah, say, say safe search. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. What if the guy yeah. is a con though? Right. right. There, there's there's an issue here. Is that is that you know I'm going to go and use some company to um, do you not want to go to Italy again? Jeff? Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> to Italy? Are you going to boycott? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you call him a con, he might, you know. <laughs> he could sue you, get, too. Get sued, right. Well, let's say, let's say that I, I, I go on and I use Google the way it's used, which is to find, uh, you know, a rotor router, a, a, a septic tank cleaner, and, I, and I'm comparing between three of them. Well, one of them may be bad, and there's reviews up all over saying the person's bad, and Google ends up summarizing that as to say con. Or in my case, perhaps the idea that Dell sucked. Right. Yep. We're, uh, we're going to take a little break. Coming up, Chipotle's hidden menu. <laughs> <laughs> this, I see why you don't hide that. What? This is my gift to you. <laughs> oh, that was you, Jeff? I thought that was Eileen. Awesome. No, that was me. I, I'm going to give you a full field report, and I, 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 you're, wel you're welcome. This is why people listen to this show. You thought it was Google, the cloud, Amazon? No. Chipotle. I, I admit I'm, I'm actually really curious. My you daughter, see? we go to Chipotle probably once every two weeks, you know. And why do not? Why do they not advertise on this show? I'm just baffled. Because we got to give Leo. Have honestly, you contacted like, them? Yes. I mean, maybe they, they wanted to give Leo. us free tacos. Free <laughs> tacos? Well, do you give the code Twig at the counter or something? No, that would be good. Go ahead, Jeff. The Sorry. Said, the guy said, give us a proposal. Oh. Well, have we proposed? I don't know. Ask your staff. I don't think I so. I am. Lisa! <laughs> All right, we shall work on that. But, but we also have other news about uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon. Wait. Actually, 
Kind of an interesting uh, leak of, uh, of the next Google um, Android Marketplace with an interesting application. We'll talk about that in a second, but before we do, I would love to mention our friends at Squarespace.com, the secret behind exceptional websites. Uh, Squarespace uh, is just doing a great job, and I don't know if, uh, I guess I can't, I can't talk about the next, version 6 is on its way, and it's just amazing. I want you to take a look, version 5, pretty darn good as it is. If you go to Squarespace.com slash twig, you can see what this, what all the ruckus is about. This is the next generation of web hosting and content management software all rolled into one. Now, if you've got an existing site, you can import it using the uh, traditional APIs, Blogger, TypePad, WordPress, Movable Type. You won't just import the posts. You'll import all the images. The links will stay true, all the comments too. And true to Google's uh, you know, data liberation organization, it goes both ways. You can get into and out. You're never trapped. They've got a great iPhone and iPad app. Actually, the reason the importing is important is when you try it for free, you can literally just you know, create a site without a credit card or anything and, 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 and you know, play with all the great templates and stuff and then import your data so you can really get a sense of what your new Squarespace site would look like. Add some social widgets for Flickr, Twitter, RSS feeds and more. Uh, some beautiful photo galleries. A lot of photographers and uh, artists use Squarespace. Of course, there's some advanced features like form building and data collection and forums that make it, they're, they're advanced in the sense that the capabilities are advanced, make it very easy, though. You don't have to know anything. No CSS or JavaScript needed. Very intuitive editing. It's all drag and drop. I'll tell you, just take a look at the examples. You'll realize a Squarespace blog can go anywhere you want to go. Squarespace.com slash twig. Try it free today. Get two weeks free. It's great, a great way to show uh, your school, your civic group, your your friends and family what a website forum could look like. And then you say, here, here's the password. It's yours. I, I think this is really a cool idea. Squarespace.com slash twig. We thank them for their support of this week in Google. Chris Tabona is with us. He's project, pro, I'm sorry, program manager for open source at the Goog. I guess I teased it, so I better give it, give it, even though this really is like what you would traditionally put it as the last story, the kicker, the silly season story of the show. Is this the burrito? Ch story? Yes, Chipotle's secret menu. So uh, I forget what what's the blog there, Leo, on the list. Um, it is Serious now. New York Eats. Right. Serious so Eats, I, yeah, New York. Yeah. Com. Serious God Eats. God bless. Com. You see, this this is the beauty of network world. Uh, someone on Twitter, a, a Twig uh, fan, said, uh, "Jarvis, you got to go to this this <laughs> Chipotle," and link me to that. And this is a special Chipotle where there is a, a well known chef. No, no, this is in Manhattan, 18th and 8th. Okay. I, wouldn't, I wasn't going to tell the world until I went. First. Oh, I see. So you Plus gave us you gave us some just random link. Aha! Now this is the real link. And so at 18th and 8th, they have a, a, a chef who's been working behind the counter there and creating special stuff. Oh. So the best part of this is that he has a, corn, a, a chicken and pork chorizo meat selection in addition to the usual chicken and beef and such mm. and such. And it is killer. It is charred <laughs> and spicy and wonderful. <laughs> And, and they then, have margaritas. <laughs> they have margaritas, which is the other great part, which they make with Patron. <laughs> Patron. And, <laughs> whoa, Patron margaritas. I'm it, there. It is true. And they, uh, uh, they also do the pork and the beef differently because some of those things come in that, what's that way you cook it in the bag? It's da, da, da. Yeah. They do it, they do it specially. What do they, there. What do they the call it? El Pastor? Is that what they call that? Right. The, the salsas are all done differently in this store. <laughs> the beans are done differently in the store. They use a different rice that's more kind of brownie stuff with stuff in it. They, the tortilla is whole wheat. Mm. It's like, you remember the Bizarro episode of Seinfeld? This is the Bizarro Chipotle. But it's a test kitchen for them. Yeah, it is, but it's, but it's public. And they, and, they, and they don't, you wouldn't know a thing is different. You wouldn't know anything at all, which is kind of brave of them because it's, you know, the old Holiday Inn, no surprises, McDonald's all the same. You go into this one, and, and, and the flavors are just different, and it's really good. <laughs> well, Chelsea's a pretty crazy neighborhood. <laughs> I it like is. Chelsea. I've always liked Chelsea. <laughs> I like Chelsea a lot. I, I am so going to this to this. Well, store. I'm coming got... out to New York for Blog World in May. Ah! Field ah. trip. Why don't you come too, Gina? We'll have a field trip. I'm thinking about New York in May. What, when, what's... Well, yeah. we'll, we'll talk offline. What are the blog world I was going to speak of Blog World, too, yeah. Are you? Well, maybe we could all yeah. do the show from Blog World. Blog World Expo. 
You know, we do it Dot from Chipotle. Com. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Maybe we could go from this Chipotle. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is May 24th through 26th. Oh. Oh, come on, Gina. Right. Just we'll, stay we'll a little talk. longer. Let's see what I can do. Stay a little. You know, I think I'll be in New York then. I'll come by. And have a <laughs> Great, Chris, yeah. you're on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, that's my little gift for you. Thank I you. To, I usually I'm a, I'm a Chipotle for lunch only guy, but the other night I was teaching late, and my wife said, "To heck with you, I'm eating first. And so I went home, went by there, and I had a nice margarita, which I wouldn't nor normally do, and I ah. had the bowl with the. Chorizo, and it was lovely. I'm getting, you're making me so hungry. Let's run through the last few stories so I can get the hell out of here. <laughs> Twitter, Twitter's getting a tax break from San Francisco. San Francisco has a fairly onerous... Does that pass? Yes. San Francisco has a fairly onerous uh, payroll tax, 1.5% payroll tax, not just on payroll but on stock options. And so when a company goes public in San Francisco, it costs millions. Um they passed an exemption for not just for Twitter, but from any company that's in kind of the tenderloin, um, you know, kind of the nasty areas of San Francisco. Twitter is going to take over uh, the uh, old uh, landmark on uh, 10th and Market Street, which is just on the edge of that area. They say they'll save $21 million in payroll taxes over the next couple of years thanks to this tax break in San Francisco. I got no opinion on it. I think uh, it makes sense for the city to keep companies like Zynga and Twitter happy, the, uh, the, the, the commercial real estate um, prices, the employment in San Francisco is in great shape. The economy is in great shape. And it's because of the tech companies that are there. Okay. So you want to keep them there. But uh, there are a lot of people say, ah, why should Twitter get a break? Um, Mad Men will be streaming on Netflix, joining Glee. Netflix is interesting. I think that they're getting mm -hmm. into the distribution business. That's exactly what they're doing. Mad yeah, Men is made by a company called Lionsgate and licensed to uh, the movie, whatever, the A&E, whatever channel. AMC. 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 Right. AMC. Right. For millions of dollars. that They have made a secondary deal now for a, what, what's estimated to be a million dollars an episode. For all the seasons of Mad Men for streaming. Right, rather, rather than selling it to TBS or some right. other you know, worse outlet. Well, and how long before they go right to Netflix and, and eliminate AMC entirely? Hey, you know, it's already happened. It's already happened. I think we had it on the list last week. That's right. A company, uh, yeah, they're, they're Netflix making some has Netflix only products. Uh, first shows. run series. Yeah. And so Netflix, and, and this is a beautiful, beautiful moment because it breaks open potentially the hegemony of the old networks. And so, you know, we'll once again ask, why do we need a network? Why do we need a network? There's a territorial yeah. level that we don't really need. And uh, why do we need a cable company? Why do we need all that stuff? You know, MSOs. We well, don't. you know, and the cable companies have really resisted a la carte pricing, which has been very frustrating. I mean, it's like, you know, to get the Sopranos back when I had cable, you would end up having to pay $150 uh, a month. Oh, and an HBO HP really didn't ever so, want to put that on iTunes or anywhere. I mean, they really, they realized that was where their money was. Although you have to wonder if Netflix... At seven dollars ninety nine cents a month for a streaming subscription, are they going to make their million dollars an yeah, episode back, don't. or is this just their way of saying we want to be in this business? I, I think you're right; it's their way of saying that. But but uh, you know, they can account for this in many ways, right? Because it, it's not just on the money on the Netflix. It's how many people now, you know. I'm going to confess something here, worse even than that. I go to Chipotle for dinner, which is. I don't use Netflix. Netflix.com wow. slash twit. <laughs> Never have. Never have. We've been looking for people who don't so. use Netflix. I don't think there are any, many of them. Please sign <laughs> up today. <laughs> so I will. I will. And all the so you know the thing. Well, be an this, this knocks me over the edge. Seven ninety nine, and you can watch Mad Men. You can watch Glee. I'm doing it. I'm doing it's it. To it's great. It's really great. Totally yep. worth it. Completely worth it. And I have it. to say, you, you know, the, the, the other side of this equation is that now people with PlayStation 3s and Xboxes and Wiis and Roku boxes, many new TVs, almost yes. all the new Blu-ray players, they all have Netflix streaming capability on but a big not screen. not Honeycomb. Not Honeycomb. <laughs> yet. Not no, any no, Android. No. Any Android yet. Anyway, sorry. That was my little no, line. No, I don't, I, I don't blame you. You can get it on iOS. You can get it on... But Google TV, which is an Android build, but not... It is on Google TV? It is. Okay. It is. It's anyway, kind of the old, the old interface, but yeah. There's something related in a very different way that happened today. God help me. When I mentioned this name on this show, there are certain people who get all mad at me. They don't love him. But Glenn Beck is leaving Fox, basically. Is he? Where's he going? Yeah. 
Is well, he going to join Dr. Laura and an unholy alliance to take over the world? He's going to still provide some programming. You know, Gina, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> just stop smiling. You were really, you had a face. That was a face. It's Go ahead. Beautiful. Where is he going? Where is Glenn going? Well, he's I think he's going Fox to help. do some programming for him. But the thing is that, uh, where is he going to go? I had a reporter called me today about it, and I said, there's no, you know, he's going to go to the internet. He's going to go direct. And, and, and you've talked to Howard, I'm sure, about, well, about this. Well, I'll reveal a secret now. I've never said this out loud before, so I'll reveal it here, is that when the negotiations were going on with Sirius for Stern, I was asked to make contacts for Stern, and I made them with Google. I made an introduction to Schmidt. And it didn't happen. Stern stayed, you know, he stayed a bit, you know, chicken or, you know, wise. Maybe the world isn't ready, so he's <laughs> staying on Sirius for now. Sirius but offered... Howard half a billion dollars. That's yeah. why. <laughs> so I, I don't blame the guy. I wanted him to make the internet, but it's going to take one big star to make the internet ready for stars. I was hoping it was going to be Howard Stern. I fear now it could be Glenn Beck, but you're going to see entire series start through these new distribution ways, and you're going to see stars who operate with great control Absolutely. in this new way. And so unfortunately, it could be Glenn Beck could become <gasps> the hero of the internet. Please. How's that for turning your star? Could be, could be Oprah. I I'll it. take Leo over Glenn any day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to start crying in the oh, middle of the show. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Uh, uh, I'm trying to get a raise uh, here. No. Yeah, you're Actually, we did Jeez. give you a raise, by the way. We, you did. Yeah. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. It worked. Gina <laughs> the Haskell Trapani there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, Mr. Laporte. You're the best. <laughs> Obama's gonna uh, gonna uh, go to uh, face. Speaking of Glenn Beck, going to go to Facebook headquarters to do a town hall with Mark Zuckerberg, and immediately uh, the questions from uh, many on the right: Where's the Republican candidates? When does Sarah Palin get her town hall at Facebook? Well, don't you don't you just wouldn't you pay to watch Sarah Palin and Mark Zuckerberg and the lack of ability to understand each other? <laughs> that would, it would be a beautiful. I pay for thing. that. I pay to watch that. <laughs> Fortunately, these these are not pay per view events. Thank goodness. <laughs> I pay for that. New York Times. I'm not so sure that I'd pay for. It. Well, that's interesting. You know, Arthur Oaks Salzberger uh, talking about the paywall at the New York Times. First of all, it said it didn't cost us forty million dollars. He didn't give a number, but he said it wasn't it wasn't that much. It's it's not accurate. It's vastly wrong. Okay, fine. Twenty million, whatever. Um, but what he did say is, in response to the complaints, that it's it's pretty darn confusing because, in fact, we were talking with Cory Doctorow this morning on triangulation. If you didn't see it, uh, tune in uh, triangulation ten. He's great. But Corey said, you know, the problem with this paywall, among other things, is it's too darn confusing. How do you know how many times you visited New York Times this month? And to make it even more confusing, some visits don't count against the quota. Salzberger said. We don't agree it's too complex. It's new. Let it breathe for a little bit before you make judgment. It's like red wine. We don't have any numbers. I wish he'd said, you know, but he's not. I wish he'd it. give numbers. You know, and they complain at the Times how the Wall Street Journal gives no numbers for anything. And, and the assumptions about the Wall Street Journal's paywalls are all off, say the people at the New York Times. But the New York Times should be transparent about this. And... It's good for the industry. If they believe that pay is, works and is necessary for journalism, well, then they should do it. The other, thing they should, the other reason they should do it is that if it would only work for the Times and not work for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, then the Times should be aware of that because the numbers I've gone through with some executives, you know, maybe it'll work at the Times and I'll pay for it at the Times and I want the Times to succeed and you know, that's all wonderful. But just because it works for the Times does not mean it will work for anyone else. The numbers are not going to stack up. A little leak uh, of the Android Marketplace 3.0. A number of Android uh, fan sites ha had it. And uh, among other things, uh, look, here's a, uh, an app, a music app. It's the Android player with streaming. Can streaming it, capabilities. Can it be true? How do I find out if it's streaming? Uh, uh, this is, go, go into settings. This is Eileen's phone. Okay, we're going to go to settings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Google account. Stream music via Wi-Fi. So there's streaming in here, and you now. But what's not, what's missing in here is what are you connecting to? So the presumption is this is going to connect to a Google streaming music service. Yes, looks that way. I didn't have any success uh, setting it up, though. I mean, the, I, if well, you tap Google account, I wasn't nothing was listed. There's nothing so hooked it's not, up. 
Right. It's just that's just not hooked up yet. Yeah. But but interesting for sure. Interesting. I wonder who is would, that just a shot I across wonder, Amazon's bio? I wonder who would know anything Perhaps. about mm. this. I wonder who we could ask. If there were anybody anybody I, around. I could I could go out in the hallway and ask if you want. <laughs> what outgoing open source guy do we know at Google? Yeah, former <laughs> former open source program manager, Chris Awkward. <laughs> Awkward. I won't ask. I won't ask. But that that's interesting, of course. Amazon uh, really pr with a preemptive strike, although I have a theory on this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago said Amazon Cloud, actually a week ago Tuesday. Um, still waiting for iTunes uh, so the Apple obviously has been working on this. They bought Lala. They built this big network center. Uh, Google, Google Music, we've heard rumors about this. Everybody wants to get into this business. I have a theory, though. I think everybody was standing right on the, the edge saying of the cliff, looking at the other guy. You're you going to go? You're going to go? And they tricked Jeff Bezos into jumping because now all the lawsuits from Sony and everybody else Hit Amazon first. Let Amazon establish the legal precedent for doing this. Record companies aren't happy. Canary into the coal mine. Yeah. Let's see if Amazon can get away with it. Yeah, that I'm just picturing the uh, the cliff, actually. One, two, three, psych. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. I, I, well, I, uh, maybe that was that meeting with Stephen and Eric uh, at that cafe last year. Maybe that's what they were that talking about. That was like about. a year ago. I know. Come well, on. it takes a while, you know. Let's make Jeff jump. Okay, I okay. You say one, two, three, and I'll go. Uh, and then we'll stop. <laughs> and, and I hear this mad, psychotic laugh fading off in the distance. <laughs> you know, yes, the crazy Jeff Bezos no. laugh. <laughs> but Jeff might have been right. Uh, Bezos might have been right. You know, maybe uh, by f first mover advantage by getting this in there, and and a lot of legal uh, experts say no, he's, he'll he'll be able to survive a legal challenge to this. Certainly, Amazon thinks it's going to be. However. There we go. Well, uh, you wonder, too, whether Amazon is in a better position to survive it also because everyone is going to depend upon Amazon right. as the primary retail channel of the world. Right. But far, they, I'd say Sony and everybody else would far prefer Amazon to Apple. Right. And I'm sure they don't have any, any faith that Google could create a successful marketplace. They've really not shown that they can do this. In fact, I think Google's smart. I think Google encouraging Amazon to do an app store yeah. uh, and, to, and to do vetting and all of that, that's good for Google. We've we talked yeah. about that before. All right, let's, uh, we've got to wrap this up because it's time for TNT. Um, Gina Trapani, your tool of the week. My tip of the week tip this of the week. week. Actually, yeah, this was kind of a big product launch this week. And I have to confess, I have not turned it on because I'm kind of funny about this location thing. But Google Latitude um, added a feature. If you, if you enable it in the new Google Maps on Android, it basically tracks you where you go and where you've been. And it, um, it gives you this private dashboard that shows you statistics about, you know, where you spend your time at work or at home. And, you know, I haven't turned it on. And actually, Leo, I wanted to ask you if you had turned it on. Yeah, because I invited you and, you and Jeff and you both ignored my invites. I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I'm a little funny about the location stuff. I, I use Foursquare, but I only check in where I want to. With Latitude, this is sort of like in the background tracking wherever you go. Um, you know, I use this software called Rescue Time, which basically does the same kind of on my computer. It watches all the different apps that, that, that I mm. use. Uh, but, but there's something about tracking my location. Oh, yeah, that was my... And so Leo's got up on the screen right now. This, this is my backup. Yeah, it was, this is my tip, backup but tip. But we didn't, we didn't talk, talk about, about the Latitude. Uh, this is brand new. See your location history dashboard if you've enabled location history for a latitude. So I do use latitude. It can see where I am and where my friends are. I did, when I did, when I, when I turned this on, I went through and pruned everybody out who wasn't actually a friend because I'm letting uh, people see my actual uh, location. But, uh, but I actually kind of like this because it checks in automatically. It shows mm -hmm. where my friends are on the map. Um, I, don't, I don't really mind. I kind of I like it. So I guess um, if you have it enabled for a couple of weeks, you get that dashboard with these charts about like, you know, you spend this many hours a week at work and this many hours a week at home, which is this kind of nice, like personal it's data. It's been dashboard. available on the web for some time. And it's very, oh, it? yeah. it's very creepy. Is it creepy? See, this is why it's I really didn't enable it. Because I was like, I'm not sure. Even though that's to it's totally private, all the stats are aggregated and private, not for anyone else. It kind of gives you an interesting look at you know where you've been and what you're doing let me show you because my i i have been using it i've had it enabled for several years wow and uh so it says it gives you like pie charts of uh -huh. how much time you spend at work uh how much time you spend at different places shows you the places you've been to the most it's actually I can't you, wait till this is used in divorces 
<laughs> oh, well, because it's, you know, you have to log into my account. Right. So it's right, kind of right. my my material. Let me see if I can, I can Did it give you any this. insights about your whereabouts, Leo? Yeah, I spend you... too much time at work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that doesn't mostly, surprise me. Mostly that's what it was. So this is the Google dashboard. Everybody should know about this anyway. Google.com. Yeah, the privacy dashboard, dashboard is really important. Dashboard. Yeah, this so. is great. So here's latitude. So if I click uh, location history, I have traveled. What is that? What, how many meters is that? I've traveled 19 million kilometers. <laughs> 19 million kilometer. No, no, I'm sorry. 19 million meters. That's what is that? 190,000 kilometers? I don't know what it is. So I've got it enabled, and I can view my uh, check-ins. Uh, where do I see my history? It's really kind of cool because you, um, yeah, see, I spend my time at work is green. My time spent out is blue. My time at home, so 50% of my time at home. There, You see, this is the gym. I spend a lot of time at the gym. Yeah, hey, good oh, for yeah, you. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 29 hours last week at work. You, you hacked that. I know, Leo. Actually, I know that's that's <laughs> game. This is yeah, kind it's of like, embarrassing. Like, let's, let's edit it. Because I say how much, you know, oh, I work so hard. I only spent 29 hours at work last, last week. <laughs> 15 <laughs> hours at work on average. I suck. <laughs> I say. So, so there's a lot of insight in here. 15 hours a week I spent out. 23 hours a week on average. I, I, I spent a lot of time at home. Here's the graph. Countries visited, airplane trips. I mean, this is pretty cool. It's super cool. Yeah. You know? Um, Except when you're getting divorced and your wife logs into your account. But otherwise, it's really cool. <laughs> just kidding. Just Looks kidding. Looks like I spent a lot of time at Gina's house. I don't know. <laughs> it is. It's all there, and it's automatic, and it's on your phone and everywhere you go. And, I, you know... So it's nice that you can see that in your phone, but that but actually that dashboard's been around a while. And uh, Leo, if you were man, going I, to, I just uh, really fly too much. That's that, whenever I look at those. That's I go, what you man, see. Yeah. What was I doing in yeah. Doha? You yeah, know, why am it's I like, traveling so much? Yeah. yeah. Um, Leo, if you were going to Tiffany's to buy your wife a present, and you didn't want her to see that. How hard is it to turn off temporarily? Well, no, no one sees it unless they log into your account, right? It's not public at all. Um, you'd have to That's turn correct. off location services on your phone, I guess. You know, they're not really clear about that. <laughs> no, I see, this is actually where I disagree with you. It, where I think it would be creepy if we didn't show this information to you personally, not anybody else. But it's like, you know, when you have these services, you know, they are keeping that information. Yeah. And people don't that's read true. the term Everybody service, knows. You know what? That's a very good point. Every, well, yeah, it's a I, Apple that's a knows point. this too. It's just that they're showing Google saying, look, we do know this. I've traveled yeah. 12,218 yeah. miles and uh, I will reach the moon in 213,403 more miles. So this is Man. like a graph of my way. I like that. That's how close to the moon yeah. I've gotten. Yeah, that's, Dang, that's you really neat. You don't go anywhere, I think, dude. I think no, this, I, this must be, oh, I mean, I must not have. Uh, Maybe you just turned it on. Recently. I must have just turned it on because you're right. I've traveled I thought you a lot traveled more than, more than that. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've traveled a lot more than that. So it mustn't have been on. Uh, history range. Oh, wait a minute. That's only, uh, yeah, see, I think so you can enable the range. Look at this. This is this is my map of travels in the last two days. So that's, that's how really often cool. this is how often it uh, check in, it checks in. Yeah, look at this. I mean, uh, Leo, I yeah. just put on the on the page at the very bottom under also uh, a German politician, of course, of course, suing um, sued a phone company there to get all of their green to get all of their data on everything they had for him in their phone system, right? Yeah, um, and. So then the Zeit came along, my friend uh, Wolfgang Blau, and they um, visualized all the data. And it's, it's actually, I mean, this gets creepier because the phone company has much more data on you, right, in terms of where you go in their system, and it's all subpoenable and all that. Right. Fascinating. It's not even, you know what, this is the sad thing, and I, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, it's not even a subpoena that they need. It's a, what's called a pen register, right. which doesn't even mm -hmm. need a court order. All the cell phone companies have portals that any law enforcement official can go to and just say, where was Jeff last night? And you can even set a uh, standing pen register that they send tracking information the whole time. And the reason this is is because the courts at this point say that uh, ser you know, search and seizure without content doesn't need a, is, you know, has a lower level of uh, right. standard of uh, uh, proof. And... Uh, that means to and from on email messages, not subjects, not contents, and GPS locations are considered to be non-content. 
So you're absolutely right, Chris. This is information that every cell phone carrier knows about you and will gladly, for a small fee, share with any law enforcement agency, any government yeah. agency. So Chris may have just convinced me to turn it on. I might as well see what they can see, right? Yeah, I like well, it. I mean, so just don't show your wife. That's all. Google for things they should be legitimately <laughs> concerned about with their governments. You know, yeah. it, yep. it's like you know, we just try to be upfront about it. We say, here's our privacy it's policy, here's amazing. the privacy dashboard, here's data liberation. You know, if you're not comfortable with this, don't use that tool. Don't go to that site. And, and you know, it, it's it it can be really. You know, people get you know, put onto Google that which is really the province of their government. So. I do, I do think that this would be incredibly useful twenty years from now. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, if I've kept this for a long period of time, I do wish there were more data in here. Actually, mm. I think it's fascinating. And you I, know, and there, there, this reminds me that there, I can't. I'm looking for it now, but but if you go to Chrome, um, and put on incognito. Yeah. It warns you that it says, okay, this is what you can do, but it warns you in there. I can't find it right now. That, uh, well, be also be aware, though, even if you turn on, you know, that someone could be looking over your shoulder or secret, I swear it says the secret agents could be watching. <laughs> <laughs> it says surveillance by secret agents, malicious yes. software that tracks your keystrokes in exchange for free smileys, internet <laughs> service providers or employers that track the pages you visit, websites that collect and share information about you, people standing behind you. People standing behind you actually is a relevant and Says important that, thing right to there. tell people about. Well, I mean, you know, because the thing is, sometimes we get people who are like, I am afraid that this government is following me, and they 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 probably have compromised Google. And I'm like, you know, if, if a secret agency is really following you, you should look outside your front door. You shouldn't leave your house and have them walk in and install something on your machine. Right. I mean... These people well, are... Well, stop using Foursquare. Yeah, yeah. And, and I even mentioned the fact <laughs> stop that... Stop using Foursquare. If you're worried about Google, don't worry about Google. Worry about your internet service provider. They actually even know more about you. Your cell phone company, your internet service provider together know I, more I think it's about okay you. to worry about Google. I mean, we're a big company. We do a lot. And people do search through us. And that's really important. But, you know, it, it, don't just stop there if you're actually worried about these problems. You know? Good point. So. Yep. Jeff Jarvis, your number of the week. Uh, a minor interview, but after last week I did uh, Lady Gaga's uh, followers <laughs> on Facebook. This week I was struck that Argentine footballer Leo Messi in seven hours got seven million likes in Facebook. Holy wow. moly. And what struck me about that, I think we, I, you know, uh, I keep forgetting how much smaller Twitter is than Facebook still. You know, Facebook has ten times the photos that Flickr has. Um, and, and Flickr has five billion of them. Um, you know, the size of Facebook just, just I, I, I kind of forget once in a while, but seven hours for seven million likes is one hell of a commentary on the power of Facebook, I think. I actually uh, gave you a number. Oh, you did? I didn't see it. Well, that's okay, because I'm going to steal it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, have a, I have a number for you guys if you want one. Good. Okay. I'll do a number, then you do a number, Chris, and then I'll do my, uh, my tool of the week. But the numbers, I got an email from StumbleUpon. They, uh, they, had, they hit one billion, one billion with a B, monthly stumbles wow. uh, in the month of uh, January. The first time they've ever reached a billion. That's this. If you thought StumbleUpon was no, no longer uh, you know, relevant or germane, they've gone up since, this is July 2010 here. Look at this steep jump. Wow. Yeah. Good for them. Somebody, the reason I, I noted that is uh, I was talking to some a social media expert or somebody, maybe somebody would email me, said, you know, really ought to get your pages on StumbleUpon. It's, it's an amazing traffic tool. Doi. <laughs> your number, Chris Tabona. Uh, actually, I'm going to let you down. Uh, I was going to find the Lady Gaga questions on the <laughs> question and answer service we have for when she visited. And, and I, I just remember being like 100 times what Elmo got when we did the public <laughs> Elmo one. Gaga got more than Elmo. That's all I need to know. <laughs> um, that was on Moderator, Chris? If I find it before you shut down. What's that? That was on Google Moderator? Yeah. I'm going to show you uh, the... I really... This, this is kind of a long-standing tool tip. We've mentioned it before, but... If you haven't yet installed the Amazon App Store on your uh, Android phone, do because, as we've mentioned before, every day uh, a free app. Uh, and today the free app is one that I particularly like called Pixay Pro. There have been a kind of a dearth of great camera apps on uh, the um, 
on the Android platform. But this is one of them. It lets you put captions, modify photos. It's a really a lot of fun. And it's normally, uh, I think it's normally a couple of bucks. Uh, yeah, four bucks. It's uh, free today uh, on the Amazon App Store. And every day there's a new free app. And some of them are, are, are pretty good. So uh, if, you don't, if you don't yet uh, have Pixay Pro, here's your chance to get it free. This is one I've actually paid for some moons ago. Here, I can launch it here. There's a little Can you use Pick Please? I seem, I seem to remember you using I that. like Pick Please. That's a posting service, which would go mm -hmm. great with Pixay Pro, because what you do is you take yeah. a picture, and you, you do something on it. You capture it. Uh, here, I'll p pull up a picture uh, here. Um, this is my dog. And, uh, yeah. and I can take it. I'll do the maximum size. And then I can put a caption on it. I can do all sorts of a, you know special effects and so forth. This is actually an amazingly deep program. It's just not, you think Pixay Pro, oh, it's all about captioning. But all of these, these are filters. I mean, this is actually one of the most sophisticated apps I've seen uh, for cameras. Stickers. I can put masks Ooh. and glasses on my doggy. And word balloons. <laughs> and word balloons. All kinds of criminal <laughs> things to do to images. Yes. Pixay Pro free right now on the Amazon App Store. Gina Trapani is free, free, free at smarterware.org. Her great blog, you must read it. Great, great to be here. Great show. Always great to talk with, with Chris. Thanks for yes. being on today. Let we, we're going to make sure you come to uh, New York late in May for the special mm. Chipotle menu. Yeah, well, we're going to talk. I'm, I think I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> blog world, world, who cares? But Chipotle. Yeah, no, that's what's... I, I, yeah, absolutely. Jeff Jarvis. Absolutely. Je, Buzzmachine.com. What would Google do? And soon, I can't wait, public parts will be in bookstores. Thank you for uh, being here, Jeff, as always. And the great Chris Tabona, longtime friend, and the man in charge of open source um, projects at Google, code.google.com slash SOC to learn about the summer of code. Yeah, and he's on important. Twitter, at C-D-I-B-O-N-A. That's right. What do you tweet? I tweet things. <laughs> Is know. that your motto? I tweet things? Quips. Quips, Little puns, pictures, you know. Pictures yeah. of uh, animals, that kind of thing. No, I, you know, I actually I don't tweet that much, so it doesn't cost a lot to be my friend on Twitter. See, I, that's the new. <laughs> by the way, that's the new black. I never tweet. Oh, really? Follow me. <laughs> yeah. Low cost. I'm a low cost Twitter friends. I'm a low cost person to follow. I never say anything. I tweet like once a day at most. You know, yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of like that too. That's a good rate. Yeah, see the bona on the Twitter. Thank you everybody yeah. for being here. We'll see you next time. We shoot. We do the show every Wednesday. At uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern Time at live.twit.tv. Next week, we'll be in Vegas for the National Association of Broadcasters. So Tom mm -hmm. Merritt will be in filling in for me next week, I'm sorry to say. Broadcasters, I, Leo, broadcasters? What are you doing hanging out with I know. Them? You know, there's a certain irony, Jeez. I have to say, to going to the NAB show. Um, we are the official podcast partner of the National <laughs> Association of Broadcasters. <laughs> I couldn't say no. I thought, that's so funny. I'm definitely doing it. Uh, we're we're gonna you know what there's a lot of cool gear there uh, and believe it or not a lot of gear that new media people uh, will find very interesting so we thought it'd be that's like fun. that's like being the official blogger of the calligraphy association I know <laughs> <laughs> I'm using that do you mind if I steal that well, please please uh, do well I'm also going to be on a panel on uh, Wednesday the broadcast mind panel uh, with um, uh, Adam Carolla. And uh, who's from the NBA? I got to see if I can find this. Um, it's a oh, really cool, cool panel talking about uh, using new media. Uh, new Tech is sponsoring this. The folks that do our uh, TriCaster, um, the Broadcast Minds panel uh, from the NBA, St. John's University. Adam Carolla and I will all be on that panel to talk. Steve Helmuth, that's who it is, from NBA Entertainment. And Mark Fredo from uh, St. John's University. So that's going to be fun. We'll broadcast that live. Uh, next, I think it'll be a week from uh, today in the evening. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time on Twig.